Fifteen years ago, Mel Gibson's film, The Passion of the Christ, was released to hostile reviews, but strong audiences. It was soon the highest grossing Christian film of all time. One of the most moving moments in the film is when Mary, played by Maya Morgenstern, runs to meet her son, played by Jim Caviezel, on his way to the cross, and the two strengthen each other. Gibson uses poetic license to put on the suffering Christ's lips the words he speaks from his heavenly throne in today's second reading. See, Mother, how I make all things new. Gibson's transposition was theologically insightful. But Christ's glory was in his passion, not just his rising and ascension. In our Gospel today, Jesus begins his track to the cross, declaring, Now is the Son of Man glorified. Now, in his self-emptying, humiliation, suffering, Sure, Jesus will rise victorious, but even then, with his wounds. Sure, he is the Lamb reigning from the heavenly throne, but he is also the Lamb that was slain, whose sacrifice takes away the sins of the world. It was in his suffering and his response to suffering, that Jesus was glorified. This great mystery was one Jesus often taught, but his disciples rarely grasped. That only by spending our lives do we get them back. Only by pouring ourselves out are we filled up. Only by chancing humiliation will we be glorified. Only by serving have true authority. Only by doing what is right will we have a shot at happiness. It's only by taking up the deadening cross that Christians are brought to new life. Only by being sown as seeds dead in the ground that the church sprouts anew. Now Jesus joins this revelation of glory transfiguring darkness to his love commandment. What is glorious is not suffering itself, but suffering and still loving, enduring lovingly, loving patiently. No longer is his commandment just love one another, love your neighbour as yourself. Now it's love as I have loved you. Lay down your life for your friend. And even the pagans will say, see how these Christians love each other. Dear neophytes, our newest Christians, today you give thanks for your journey to Easter and those who influenced it. Today we give thanks for the faith and courage that brought you to us. Together we thank God for the great gifts of baptism, confirmation and Eucharist by which Christ makes all things new. 
Not that you've now ticked the Christian box. Conversion continues right until death. And indeed, even a little beyond, through purgatory. Faith must be enriched. Worship become more fervent. Service ever more generous. In today's first reading, we see that happening before our eyes. The Apostle Paul and the Bishop Barnabas make for Antioch, where we were first called Christians. Gathering the faithful along the way, telling of God's mighty deeds and opening doors for the Gentiles. They visit struggling parishes, ordaining priests to carry on the ministries of word and sacrament, confirming those already Christians and converting yet to be Christians, putting fresh heart into them all, encouraging them to preserve, persevere in the faith. Already the first Christians knew persecution. Already the temptation to fall away from their initial fervour and be converted by the culture rather than converting it. In this era, we, like them, must claim a space for people of faith and help build the church, much as the first Christians had to do. Those great theologians, the Beatles, taught all you need is love. You don't need to take up the cross. You don't need apostles and preachers, word and sacrament, and all the rest. All you need is love. And they'd be right, of course, if we really knew how to love. If divine charity truly informed our character and choices, if the author of love, God the Father himself, if the incarnation of love, God the Son, in Jesus Christ, if the very Spirit of love, God the Holy Spirit, truly shaped our hearts, relationships and actions. But we often fail to love. And even when we try, love has many counterfeits. The Beatles' generation trivialised one-night stands by calling them making love, and the result, a love child. Since then, people have been talking of loving ice cream, loving pet rabbits, loving football stars they've never met. We sentimentalise and banalise disconnecting love from faith and reason, displacing it from virtues and values. And as the currency of love is devalued, so are the subjects and objects of our loving. So our society is all mixed up about marriage, family, even friendship. Unless a relationship is sexualised and solemnised, people think it's inconsequential. Or they think that Facebook strangers are their friends. Yet friendship, in its many forms, should be our specialty as Christians. We should be the best friends, the greatest lovers. For this is Christianity's unique take on God. 
that God lives from all eternity as a relationship of love of three persons. That God, though totally self-contained, wanted our friendship so much, he gave his only son for us to be friend or not. That that son, in turn, loved us so much he gave his very life in the passion. And that that divine hand of friendship has been held out to us ever since in his word and sacraments. You might say the whole purpose of the church is to make human beings great lovers like God. To seal and deepen and stretch and mature our friendships. It's only in the context of such a renewed understanding of friendship that the Church's teachings on asylum seekers or human trafficking, on marriage or abortion, on the need for confession and communion, or on the crucial importance of religious freedom, will make sense. For they are all about more and better loving. Not after the fashion of the heart-shaped valentine, so, ma so much as after the cross-shaped love of Easter. Of course, when people see a cross, they think of funerals more than love affairs. If you gave your beloved a card with a cross on the outside for Valentine's Day, she might think you were saying you wish she was dead. Yet Christian love is cruciform because it is self-spending. It commits and serves and endures, even unto death. A love that keeps on loving when the warm feelings subside, when the loving is hard. The love we preach is a love that loves not willy-nilly, but according to faith and reason. A love that tells the story not of self-will, but of divine will. A love that seeks self-donation more than self-fulfilment. Love one another, says Jesus today to our neophytes and the old timers. Love one another as I have loved you. There humiliated, and deserted upon the cross, loving even his enemies, calling down God's forgiveness upon them. Their giving and not counting cost, turning the other cheek, praying even for his persecutors. There, uniting himself to his bride, the church, for all wounded humanity. There we learn what real friendship is and the glory of real loving, a love that makes all things new. <laughs>